as as uh, as long as you know how to assemble the stiffness matrix you would know how to assemble the other matrices as well other vectors as well so was this part clear to everybody how we assembled the stiffness matrix for the two members this was the system here at the bottom you can see let me get the laser pointer so this was the structure that we were dealing with the load was given here there were boundary conditions so one was a pin boundary condition three was a roller boundary condition okay both members had same length two meters and this was a beam problem so we had ignored the axial deformations okay and uh, we had developed the stiffness matrix for the first member and the stiffness matrix for the second member was exactly the same there was no difference between the two st uh, stiffness matrices as the ei terms were the same the ei is uniform it was given and so on and then what we do is we assemble the two stiffness matrices to make one global stiffness matrix we are calling that k total okay so the global structure has six degrees of freedom one two three four five six okay out of these six one two three four belong to member one and three four five six belong to member two all right so the then uh, we develop the stiffness matrix for member one which looks like which occupies this space okay and then the stiffness matrix for member two occupies this space and then we assemble them we assemble them in such a way so that the common degrees of freedom are repeated and then you simply uh, arithmetically add the numbers that are there in the two stiffness matrices and uh, when you put zeros here what does that mean i had explained that last time five and six five five versus one five versus two six versus one six versus two what does that mean to have zero support yeah sorry repeat please uh we derived that for a fixed uh, fixed support condition sir yeah so yeah so it basically means that if i apply uh, any unit deformation in one degree of freedom there will not be any force consequence on the fifth degree of freedom or the sixth degree of freedom okay and uh, that is true because during this process when we are applying a unit deformation at one we are keeping all other degrees of freedom fixed and yes that if that you if you do that then it is true that at fifth degree of freedom you will not have any um force consequence okay so we did this exercise then we were in the middle of this uh, um, the next step where i had to stop um basically what happens is that this was a 6 degree of freedom problem and uh, if it's a 6 degree of freedom problem you got six equations and six unknowns to deal with right that and that's how we can solve it and these six these are basically six equilibrium equations that we need to solve fine but uh, what happens is that all six values in a typical problem are not all six known values are not either displacements or forces out of these six values that are unknowns some of them are displacements and some of them are forces okay so the way we do it um, the way we take the next step is we write the six equations simultaneous equations just like they are written here let me take two steps back so we write the six equations like this now if you look at this f1 to f6 here and delta 1 to delta 6 here um all the unknowns are not on one side some of the unknowns are here and some of the unknowns are here which which ones are unknown here so let's look at the forces which forces are unknown force 1 is unknown or known unknown unknown sir unknown. correct force 2 is unknown or known it's known it's zero no one sir it's zero yes okay. so there is no there is no external moment acting on the second degree of freedom correct likewise for 3 is uh, force 3 is unknown or action i mean i'm calling it f here soon i will change this uh, nomenclature to action okay so and delta to d um, be mindful of that so the for, force 3 again is unknown force 4 is known that is zero we are not applying any external moment at 4 force 5 is known which is minus 5 right minus 5 kN and force 6 is again zero known zero known okay so the unknown forces here are 1 and 
F1 and F3 are unknown. The rest of them are all known. If I look at deltas, you will see that exactly the, the remaining quantities in delta are all unknowns. So F1 and F3, F3 are unknown. On delta side, you will see that delta 2, delta 4, delta 5, delta 6 are unknown. You can check that. Okay. So either you know the force value at a point or you know the displacement value at that point. Fine. So, delta 2 is, uh, yeah, we don't know how much rotation it will have. Delta 4, we don't know how much rotation it will have. Delta 5, delta 6, we don't know. Fine. So, what we can do is we can substitute those values. And what we will be, uh, we will be left with are still six equations, but they are kind of staggered because some unknowns are sitting here, some unknowns are sitting here. So, what we do in the next step is try to segregate the known from the unknowns. Okay or the fixed degrees of freedom from the free degrees of freedom. You understand the difference? Because where the displacements are known, those are fixed or restrained degrees of freedom. And where, where the display, displacements are not known, those are all free degrees of freedom. So your fixed degrees or restrained degrees of freedom are one and three. That's where the displacements are known. The two, four, five, and six, where the displacements are not known, you need to calculate that. Those are all free degrees of freedom. Fine. So we separate knowns versus unknowns, or you can say we can we separate the restrained degrees of freedom from unrestrained or free degrees of freedom. Okay. So we had done these steps. Basically, what we do is we bring these um, F1 and F3 are unknown, right? So these are your restrained degrees of freedom. So we bring the equations corresponding to restrained degrees of freedom. We move them down. Likewise, we move down the the delta values which are corresponding to restrained degrees of freedom down. So these are the delta 0 and delta 0 here, delta 1 and delta 3. We move them down. And as we move them down, we also move these columns, red and green columns, to the end. Okay. So as we do this, we have not changed anything fundamental at the equation for these equations. All we have done is replaced or, or like you know, rearranged the terms in the same equations. Okay. So now these F1, F3 are restrained degrees of freedom. Likewise, delta 1, delta 3 are corresponding to restrained degrees of freedom and values are 0, 0. Okay. Fine. So now this is the new six equations. This is how they look. Okay. You got F, all F values, the stiffness matrix, all delta values. Okay. Um, the way it is often referred to, now the nomenclature is slightly changing instead of F and Delta, now I'm going to call them A and D and S corresponds to stiffness. So instead of K, I'm going to use S this point onwards. This will be the nomenclature. Please play, pay attention. A will be for actions, which includes forces and moments both. Okay. A is action, which includes forces and moments. S corresponds to stiffness instead of K and D corresponds to displacements okay, instead of Delta. Now, if you can see here, these are the actions corresponding to free degrees of freedom. And these are the actions corresponding to the restrained degrees of freedom. So we can write this whole equation. If you break this uh, stiffness, stiffness matrix also in four parts, we can call this part as the stiffness terms belonging to free and free degrees of freedom. And this one restrained and free. This one is free and restrained, this one. That is free and restrained. And this one is restrained and restrained. That is stiffness terms between one and three degrees of freedom because those are the restrained degrees of freedom. Okay. So basically this equation, this entire equation has been rewritten as AF, AR. These are the four terms to, corresponding to AF. So these are individual vectors. These are not individual terms. Likewise, this SFF is not a single term. It's a sub matrix in itself. Okay. So AF, AR, that is equal to SFF, SFR, SRF, SRR, DF, DR. Okay. Any questions with this way of writing? Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, is there any rule uh, of breaking the global matrix into four parts or uh, just arbitrarily breaking? No, no not arbitrarily. They, like, what do you mean by rule? The, the procedure that we are following. Yes. You see, you don't necessarily have to break this into these parts. The six equations can still be solved as uh, individually you can pick up the equations basically what you need to solve for are these deltas 
So that's how you would do. First, you solve for these deltas. Even if these deltas were scattered, like originally, when before we re reshuffled these equations, uh, before we re rearrange these terms, starting here, you can see the delta two, delta four, delta five, delta six terms were just, uh, like kind of scattered. Likewise, your F one, F three terms were kind of scattered. You could have still solved this set of six equations. Like if you are doing it manually, but what we are trying to do is try to do it through a computerized system. So in that computerized system, it is always better to separate that into small, into unknowns and knowns, so that the same set of equations are available at one place. Okay, sir. Okay. So all we are doing is we are separating the restrained degrees of freedom from free degrees of freedom. So we can write this equation in this form. Now, if you break this equation further, you can or expand this equation. Basically, what you will see is AF is equal to SFF DF plus SFR DR. Okay. Likewise, AR is equal to SRF. AR is equal to SRF DF plus SRR DR. Okay. Which is essentially saying F1 and F3 is equal to this matrix multiplied by this vector plus this matrix multiplied by this vector. Which is true, which is basically F1 term is equal to this entire thing multiplied by this entire thing plus this entire thing multiplied by this entire thing. And likewise, F3. So you are just saying the same thing in a more um, compact way. Okay. Now, this is these two equations. So this is one equation as AF is equal to SFFDF plus SFRDR. AF is equal to SFFDF plus SFRDR. Likewise, AR is equal to write it since it is not written already ar is equal to srf df plus srr dr okay these two equations form the backbone of this entire solution okay so you should familiarize yourself with this equation. That is the same equation as this one. We have just expanded this one into this form. Okay. Now coming back to our problem. So in our problem, we had we had this stiffness matrix, which we had broken into this two equations in a way. So there were actually six equations, which we have broken into two equations. But each equation itself has, first equation has four equations and second equation has two equations. The first equation of the two equations is AF is equal to SFF DF plus SFR DR. And we can solve this set of four, uh, four equations, which is basically the first equation here, this set of four equations independently. Okay, you got four equations, you got four unknowns. All four unknowns are sitting here. Okay, the, sorry, the second part here does not require much solving. Okay, it is very straightforward. You keep substituting once you know the delta two, delta four, delta five, delta six terms by solving the first set of equations. Once you know DF, you just substitute the DF value into the second equation. AR will be equal to SRF DF plus SRR DR. SRF and SRR are known. DF is unknown right now, and DR is known. Correct. So. AR can be calculated directly. So you don't need much of a solving for the second set of equations. Only thing that you need to solve for is the first set of first set of equations. These are basically four unknowns, four equations. Okay. So these are the four AF values that we already knew, but we don't know the delta values. And these cannot be solved directly by substituting something into something. We have to solve for these simultaneous algebraic equations. Okay. Everybody agrees with this? What happened to the SRFS? R S F R D R term. So this was the equation, right? A F is equal to S F F D F plus S F R D R. So this is A F is equal to S F F. This is the first four by four matrix here of this corner. This is that matrix multiplied by D F. What happened to this term? Uh, D R is zero. Also. Yes. So since uh, all the known displacements are all zero, this entire term will be zero. So we are not adding anything here. There will be also one SFR 
dr but that dr term is zero so we are ignoring it only this much is to be solved for even if it was there it would have been a constant term that we can directly substitute from this one so you, you could have moved this to this side and solve it when would you have non zero dr right now dr is zero right when would you have non zero dr Yes, uh, support settlement or some uh, uh, like sir, that's a yes. So the boundary conditions have to be non-zero boundary conditions, right? So either your support settlement is given as a finite support settlement, so something like that. If that kind of a problem is given, then you would have a non-zero dr. Then you this this term, this second term here will not be zero, and you have to calculate that and substitute and move it to the left side, and uh, uh, deduct it from these values, and again solve the same problem. Fine. So it does not add any further complication. Only thing is that this is something that you have to be careful of. If the problem has any non-zero DRs or non-zero displacement boundary conditions, then those have to be accounted for here. In this particular problem, since the, all the loading is only uh, the load kind of a, uh, there is no boundary condition, non-zero boundary condition given. Only external loads are given. So we don't need the second term. That's why this equation. Okay, so we got this equation. This has got four coefficients. Uh, how many of you can solve a matrix or inverse a matrix? You know, you have to inverse this matrix, right? To get the values of delta 2, delta 4, delta 5, delta 6. Correct? So how many of you can do it quickly uh, or know some ways of doing this, solving this 4 by 4 matrix or invert, inverting this 4 by 4 matrix? Um, can your calculators do this four by four matrix? Yes, sir. Yeah. What size? What is the maximum size of matrix it can solve? Four by four. Four by four. Yeah. So some some calculators can do four by four also. Uh, I I remember I I have not used my calculator in like you know it does not have a battery and I somehow find a way either on Google or something to do a little bit of calculation that I have to do. Um, yeah, but I mean, I remember my MTech PhD days. I my calculator was able to do four by four calculations, four four by four matrices in that time. Yes, but that is pretty much the maximum you can get, I think, with most of the calculators. <coughs> Some of my friends used to have this Texas Instrument calculator, a fancy one, that was able to do bigger matrices and bigger integrations, etc. Anyway, so there are various ways of solving this large number of simultaneous algebraic equations. And this, these methods you should be familiar with because you may require them often. How many of you, th there is a course on numerical methods or computer methods for civil engineering, right? How many of you are taking that course? Or is it in the next semester? Or that course is dropped, is it? Nobody is taking that course, computer methods for civil engineers or computer methods for structural engineering? No, sir. No, okay. No, sir. Uh, okay, that's a bad thing. Somehow we had to, I think, drop that course because we had added this uh, industry seminars, etc. Right. So I think one of those courses we used to have this two, three credit course, two credit course. I think uh, mathematical methods. Are you taking mathematical methods or mathematics for engineers, civil engineering, or something like that? Yeah, I'm taking mathematical methods for the engineers. But that is not from civil engineering department, right? That is outside the civil engineering. Yes. Sir. Uh -huh. Yeah. So civil engineering, uh, nobody is teaching any such course. Yeah. Okay. So then I think it will be good for you at least one learning one of these methods because, uh, in in fact, now I I feel like I probably should have taught more than one methods. But anyway, I I won't have time. So uh, there are various types of um, commonly used methods for solving simultaneous algebraic equations. I will not get, go into the linear algebra theories of it. I will just explain the methods to you so that, because as an engineer, we just need to use them. There are various limitations on certain conditions. You can use them, certain conditions you can't use them. I would encourage you to read about them. And if you're interested, you can learn more. Okay. Most of the stiffness matri matrices fall in the domain where all these methods that I've mentioned here will work flawlessly. You don't have to have worry about that. They are symmetric. They are positive, uh, definite. So there is like most of these methods will work flawlessly. Okay. So if I had given you two or three equations to work with, what method would you have used? What do you call that method? If I had given you two equations to work with, x plus y is equal to something, x minus y is equal to something. I ask you to 
solve the values of x and y. These are two simultaneous algebraic equations. How would you solve them? By substitution, sir. Substitution, right? That exact same thing which you are calling substitution. What are you basically doing? You are going to add the two equations by before. First, you multiply one of the equations with a coefficient. Okay, so that the values, the coefficients of uh, x or coefficient of y matches with the coefficient of the other equation, and then you add or subtract. That's what substitution is basically, right? So that method is nothing but your Gauss-Jordan elimination method. Okay. Gauss Jordan elimination method is basically a systematic doing the same thing in a systematic way. Because if I give you 20 equations to solve simultaneously, you would require a more systematic way of doing it, right? That same substitution that you, you would typically use. So Gauss Jordan method, elimination method is just elimination, you understand, right? Elimination is exactly what you would do for two by two equation. You will eliminate you will try to eliminate the terms corresponding to either x or y. So that you can get a single equation which has x is equal to this much or five times x is equal to this much something like that correct so that is exactly what elimination method is um Cholesky decomposition is slightly more involved but it is faster especially for bigger problems and both these methods they are both elimination methods in the, and the meaning of that is that they give you exact solution okay so Cholesky decomposition i will not have time to talk about it uh, basically what happens is that you just you you break that coefficient matrix into a um, lower triangular matrix and upper triangular matrix and a diagonal matrix. Okay, and then you try to solve, which is relatively faster than the Jordan elimination method, but you require more understanding of linear algebra. Both these methods are going to give you exact solution. The problem is that both of them become very expensive computationally as the problem size increases. Okay, so. Alternatively, what we have is something called numerical method uh, or a set of numerical methods. Let me just, uh, I'm getting an important call. Give me a minute, please. Sorry. So the other set of uh, methods are called iterative methods or numerical methods. Okay. They don't give you the exact solution, but they have certain advantage, especially with larger problems. Okay. So we will use one of those methods, which is known as Gauss Seidel method to solve this problem. Okay. And I'll just show you through an example. So once you know the example, you know how to solve it. Anyway, so if we use one of the elimination methods, that is first set of this one elimination method then basically you get an exact solution and the exact solution for this problem is i have solved it already delta 2 is equal to 3.33 divided by ei delta 4 delta 5 delta 6 the values are given here okay so this is the exact solution once you know your delta values what you need to do you remember these equations af ar sff sfr srf srr df dr so what is you what you have solved for is df and your AF was already known. Your DR is already known. All only thing that is not known so far is AR. So that is pretty very easy to get now. AR is equal to SRF DF plus SRR DR. Right? AR is equal to SRF DF plus SRR DR. So all the rest are known to you. You can simply solve for AR. Once you know the AR value, you know all the reaction forces, right? All the unknown forces. And from the unknown forces, you can all you can calculate all the uh, bending moment diagrams and all the other internal forces fine so that is the entire solution so now we have solved that problem uh, i have not given you the exact the final solution to this problem but basically we have solved we have solved the delta delta 2 delta 4 delta 5 delta 6 we have solved the values were i just i just told you the values these values 3.33 6.67 and so on 
and uh, after that f1 and f3 were also could also be solved right which are basically ars right so once you know that you can draw the bending moment diagram of the entire problem now coming back to this solution so i had found this exact solution using i think i had used matlab or something to find the solution you can also solve them by hand it's not that difficult to solve four equations only right but if you had more number of equations then it would have become much harder to solve for an exact solution so this is what we have to do um i am explaining only the gauss seidel method which is one of the faster uh, or more efficient iterative method the other one was jacobi method which is basically earlier version the jacobi's method was earlier version of gauss, gauss seidel method so gauss seidel method is more efficient so i am not explaining the jacobi method i am just talking about gauss seidel so what we do is um, the idea here is that you start with an assumption we need to find the values of delta 2 4 5 6 right so we start with an assumption of all these four deltas okay then what we do is that uh, and these are basically four equations zero is equal to ei times 2 delta 2 plus 1 delta 4 plus 0 delta 5 plus 0 delta 6 that is first equation likewise second equation zero is equal to this 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 multiplied by this 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 so what we do is we assume that in the first iteration all my deltas will be one let's say we start with assumption of one you can start from zero also doesn't doesn't hurt whatever if you make the first guess very good you can reduce the number of iterations but uh, and unless you have some idea of where to start you have to start from somewhere i am starting from 1 1 1 okay <clears throat> but what we do is in the first equation the first unknown we don't substitute the value that we know but we calculate for it so from the first equation the first equation which is 0 is equal to 2 times ei times delta 2 plus 1 times ei times delta 4 plus 0 0 times delta 5 plus 0 times delta 6 what we do is we substitute delta 4 5 and 6 but we don't substitute the value of delta 2 instead we calculate the value of delta 2 likewise in the second equation we calculate the value of delta 4 likewise in the third equation we use the third equation to calculate the value of delta 5 and we use the fourth equation to calculate the value of delta 6 that is the unknown associated with the diagonal term okay so which basically means if i put that 0 is equal to 2 ei delta 2 plus 1 ei delta 4 isn't it which basically means delta 2 is equal to minus delta 4 by 2 you want me to write it 0 is equal to 2 2 ei delta 2 plus 1 ei delta 4 isn't it and the rest of the terms are all zero so i use the first equation to solve for delta 2 delta 2 is equal to ei ei will cancel out ei and ei will cancel out delta 2 is equal to minus delta 4 by 2 that's what this first equation is in the second equation that is 0 is equal to again i will not write the ei terms because they are going to cancel out anyway um 1 times delta 2 plus 4 times delta 4 minus 1.5 times delta 5 plus delta 6 okay so the second equation we used to call to solve for delta 4 that is the second unknown so my delta 4 will be equal to that is given here 1.5 times delta 5 minus delta 6 minus delta 2 divided by 4 because this 4 so this will be my delta 4 value likewise we write the equations for delta 5 and delta 6 then what we do is we start with delta is equal to 1 1 1 1 but in the first equation of course we can substitute only on the right hand side so on the right hand side whatever terms we have we have only the term of delta 4 we substitute delta 4 then we get the new value of delta 2 in the subsequent equation we substitute the new value of delta 2 here and the old values of delta 6 and delta 5 because we did not get any updates on delta 5 delta 6 so we keep updating the latest values of each terms that are that are on the right hand side okay and we keep getting the new values of delta 2 delta 5 4 delta 5 delta 6 i'll show you a few iterations here So we started with one 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 for delta two four five six. 
once we substitute the value of delta 4 in the first equation, my delta 2 changes from 1 to minus 0 0.5. And 4, 5, 6 remain as it is, 1, 1, 1. Then when we go to the second equation, the second equation is used to solve for delta 4. So my delta 2 remains the same, delta 5 and 6 remain the same, delta 4 changes to minus point, uh, plus 0.25. And likewise, keep going. we keep going. We solve for delta 5 here and we solve for delta 6 here. Okay, That is my first iteration is completed. Second iteration, again, we substitute these values. So we substitute basically delta 4, delta 5 and delta 6 to get the value of delta 2. That is this one. Then say so delta 4, delta 5 and delta 6. So we keep going like this. After four iterations, I am still at 0 0.5 minus 1.8 minus 10 minus 7. The final values were 3.33 minus 6.66 minus 26.66, I think, and minus 16.66. Okay, and where am I after four iterations? Very, very far from there. It took me about 30 iterations to reach these values. Okay, so still these values are not very close. But if you think from computer's point of view, this is, and if you think from a larger problem point of view, you would see that this method is still much more efficient than the other earlier two methods, which we have not explained to you, but any of the substitution methods would take much longer. Okay. Fine. So basically you can see that after 30 iterations, we reach pretty close but not very close, but still it is okay. And maybe for a computer, it doesn't matter. You can go to 100 iterations. By 100 iterations, you would reach almost the exact solution value. Okay, so that is one method we have explained. I will give you a small computer program as an assignment, fine, to, for you to solve uh, one set of, one matrix, basically, one set of simultaneous algebraic equations that will help you understand this method which is also important as an engineer you should know you should be familiar with some of the numerical methods okay uh, we are not be able we will not be able to give you lectures on or, or ex extra uh, lessons on uh, how to solve uh, differential equations etc i think people in mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering etc they must learn all those things but in civil engineering at least algebraic equations we should know okay any questions so far No questions. The method was clear to you, to everyone. What did we do in this method? It was clear to everyone, right? No or yes? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So moving forward. I mean, this was basically whatever I just discussed in a couple of slides here was kind of a uh, digression from the overall topic, but uh, it may be useful at some point. So that's why I thought that I'll discuss it. If you're using MATLAB, I don't, you don't necessarily have to use one of those methods. MATLAB has several inbuilt methods which can solve such matrices very quickly. But anyway, okay, so. Now, there are various smaller topics within the topic of stiffness matrix method, which we will discuss when we will before we move to the universal approach. So right now we are talking with we are dealing with beam members, right? So within beam members, I will discuss one more special topic, which you might be familiar with, and you, you might know that as fixed end moments, right? So all of you must have used the fixed end moment concept. Can anybody tell me when is fixed end moments? When are fixed end moments used in the stiffness method? Or fixed end reactions? Are you familiar that familiar with that concept of calculating fixed end moments and fixed end reactions? Fixed end forces, rather. No. It must have been taught in the stiffness method in your college. Yeah, go ahead. No, sir. No. Okay, maybe maybe it was called by different. Oh, you just studied the equations 
for different loading conditions, fixed moments. Yes. Yeah, but what is the purpose? Uh, if the external loads are acting on a member, mm-hmm. then uh, yeah, yeah, good. So uh, basically, this method that we have developed here, these equations that we have written. A is equal to A is equal to S D, right? That's what we can say. This is combined A is equal to S D. This thing is applicable wherein this A is basically all the forces that are externally applied. But where are they applied? They are applied only where there is a degree of freedom defined, right? So if this five kilo newton was acting here, it is where the degree of freedom five is already present. If this load was acting somewhere in the middle, then I had two options. I was I had an option to create a degree of freedom here, which corresponds to that loading. Okay. Or, alternatively, there is something I can be smart about. Or, but if the load was not a point load, it was a distributed load, for example, then how many degrees of freedom could I create all along the member? I cannot do that, right? So then it becomes fundamentally difficult. to address such such kind of load loading conditions and therefore we have to invent something to handle the situation when the load is not really acting at one of the degrees of freedoms we had this six degrees of freedom defined if the external loads are acting along like 1 2 3 4 5 6 then there is no issue we can handle that this equation can handle it but if the load is acting elsewhere or in other direction or if it's a distributed load then how do we handle it that is a challenge <laughs> okay so for that they have uh, people have invented something called fixed end moments or fixed end reactions or fixed end forces it is known as several by several names okay the idea for fixed end moment is as follows let me try to explain and since we are dealing with beams only here i'll explain this concept in the context of simply supported beam so let's say i have a continuous beam that i want to solve okay it is continuous beam it is continuing on both sides this span of the beam is loaded with a uniformly distributed load fine now what happens is that the challenge is that i cannot deal or my the method that i have developed it says a equals s d i have already explained to you the challenge the challenge is that i have to write the effect of this w in terms of some force that is acting at the degrees of freedom so where are the degrees of freedom here i have got degree of freedom let's say i am dealing with only beam so i don't have any horizontal movement and one degree of freedom here so this w has to be represented in terms of let's say this is n n plus 1 n plus 2 n plus 3 these are all in the stiffness terms n a n a n plus 2 okay or n plus 3 so it has to be this w has to be written in form of these forces right and if i am somehow able to do that let's say this is the beam and i'll say that okay somehow if i can say get the same effect that this w is having by applying of course there is a roller here there is still a roller here by applying some force and by applying some moment okay if i can somehow do that and get the corresponding an values right so this a and these these this this are in the same degrees of freedom then i don't have to worry about w i will have to worry about w only when we want to calculate the internal deformations because internal deformations will not be accurately predicted by these loads but as long as these deformations at these nodes are accurately predicted by these as my this equation a is equal to sd will work because all it needs to worry about is how much is the deformation here which will be affecting the behavior or the the, the interaction with the neighboring members 
internally what is happening that we can take care of later separately okay so uh, did you follow this concept so basically what we want to do is we want to get equivalent a's for the given w and what is the what is the condition for uh, how do we say that this a is equivalent to this w the condition is that because of these a forces that i am applying equivalent a i am applying for this because of this the formations or the displacements here let's say some displacement i am getting here or some rotation i am getting here because of these a values the rotation that i am getting here should be same as what i would have gotten if i had w acting here not every deformation only these two deformations here and here these should match this should match with this and this should match with this of course i cannot match all the other deformations everywhere okay as long as i am able to match this much its interaction with the rest of the system will not be affected and i can solve and i will still get a correct value of deformations and forces everywhere at the joints at least in between the joints or in between the degrees of freedom i will handle it separately okay so now i have to do what i have to do is i have to find the a value which is equivalent to w or a value that produces the same deformation that w does how do we do that it's pretty simple actually if you see let's say this was this was some kind of a simply supported beam i'm giving you now an example of a simply supported beam to keep it simple this is a simply supported beam and i have a w load acting on it okay because of this w load the beam is going to deform right it is going to have a theta 1 and theta 2 what i am saying is that i want to know see vertical forces will be directly taken care of the, by the reaction so i am not plotting them separately here but i mean if you want you can understand that too equally as what i am saying is that let me do one m1 and one m2 on the same beam in such a way that it also produces the same theta 1 and theta 2 isn't it that's what we just discussed right so we want to so this m1 and m2 will be the equivalent forces now how do we get that equivalent force there is an easy trick what we can say is that if let's say this beam even though it's a simply supported beam let's assume that it is fixed if this were a fixed beam and we had applied this w okay then what would have been the theta and theta values here theta 1 and theta 2 would have been zero correct what would have been the moments here let's say this is w uniform the moment here would have been w L square over twelve, right? In this direction, rather. And the fixed end moment here would have been same W L square by twelve, isn't it? Which is equivalent of saying, and the theta would have been zero. Theta would have been zero. Theta one, theta two. Which is equivalent of saying, or equivalent to say, you up, you take a simply supported beam, you apply the distributed load W. you get theta 1 theta 2 then you take the same beam but you apply opposite of these moments okay so instead of i'm sorry you apply um yeah you apply opposite of sorry you apply exactly these moments i'm sorry you apply exactly these moments okay what will it produce the same deflection same deflection but in opposite direction okay these moments are w l square by 12 w l square by 12 okay so this problem is exactly same as this problem right superimposition Everybody agrees with that? 
because I'm getting theta one here minus theta one here. So that's why I'm getting zero here. That I've just split the two loads separately. Now, since I'm getting, this is zero displacement here, which is basically, which basically means this W is canceling or this moment is canceling out the effect of this W. Okay. And this moment is nothing but the fixed end moment for the beam. If you apply W on it. Or in other words, if I want to have a load which is representing W, what do I need to do? Okay, so let me write this. This I'll call M fixed end moment. Both of them combined. Okay, so M fixed end moments, this, both combined, of course, they cancel the effect of W, exactly, right? They make the net fixed end moments, the, the next, the net end, deform, end displacement zero. So they cancel the effect of W. But if I want to have an M something, some kind of an M, I don't know, I, I have not given it a name, which would be equivalent of W, What would I, how would I do get that? What do I do? See, M actually cancels W completely. So which M would it be that would not cancel, but it will be exactly equivalent. It will do exactly the same thing that W is doing. Anybody? See, I need to know the moments which will actually produce theta one and theta two these fixed moments are producing minus theta one and minus theta two. So I need to get this and this of exactly W L square by two, right? In this direction, which is nothing but minus M F E M. So if I have this kind of a loading and it does not have to be distributed load, no matter what load it is, Basically, we are trying to mimic the behavior here. So whatever load is given for that, we can calculate the fixed end moments. And fixed end moments, basically what they do, fixed end moments, they basically make sure that the effect, the end effect, or the effect of the applied load at the ends is nullified. Okay, so they completely cancel the effect of the external load. That is what fixed end moments do. And we take negative of fixed end moment, which basically means that you can substitute W with those negative of fixed end moment and you will have the same effect. Did it make sense? Yes, sir. It makes, right? Everybody? Amulya? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right? Right. Okay. Fine. So, so basically, this is the basic concept here that if you have a big structure and I want to know what is, how to account for this W on this structure. Okay, I want to solve this entire structure, but my equation A is equal to SD works only for the loads, this A, which is acting at the degrees of freedom. And I cannot define a degree of freedom all along the member, right? That will be infinite degrees of freedom. I can't do that. Then I will handle the internal issues later and we will discuss that later how to account for the actual W because any kind of substitution for W will not take care of the entire thing. But at least what I can do is as far as this equation is concerned, which will, which has terms corresponding to this degree of freedom, these degrees of freedom, these degrees of freedom and these degrees of freedom only. As far as this equation is concerned, what I can do is I can get some external moments, you can call it M equivalent. Okay. And let's say this was one force acting and this is another force acting P. So this P will continue to act. And in addition to that, I will calculate this M equivalent, which so P is as it is as before, but this W has been substituted with this M equivalent. Now I can solve this frame and all the deformations and all the reactions at the degrees of freedom will still be able, we will be able to solve using this equation and we will get all the A and D values at the degrees of freedom. That is this, 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 and this at these locations. And they will be accurate, they will be correct. 
Only thing that will not be correct is if we use this further to solve the solve for displacements or bending moment diagram in the member, because bending moment diagram of this kind of a if I have this kind of a bending moment acting will be somewhat like this if it is not equal, right? Whereas the bending moment diagram for a distributed load will be like this. So the this value will be equal to this value. This value will be equal to this value. Finally, what we will get, but this intermediate values will not be equal. That we have to account for separately. You followed it? Fine. So this this becomes a very handy tool. Now this M equivalent, as we discussed, is basically nothing but minus of M FEM. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to take the already given A at the joints. Okay. So we will call it A J. Uh, what is the terminology I am using here? A external. So we will call this P term, for example, will fall under this category A external, which is directly already acting at the joints or at the degrees of freedom. Minus then I will do A FEM, and it is not only moments; it's also the forces, reactions also. Okay. So basically, that's all we do. We substitute in this in this entire matrix in this entire equation A is equal to S D. We substitute A with a external minus A F E M. Okay, so that's what this entire discussion is about. I think I've explained enough. Not spend much more time on this. Now, how do we calculate the A F E M? You already know. I mean, there is a flexibility method of analysis. So, for any kind of a given loading condition, if it's a member, it's a uh, loaded with uniformly distributed load. You know the fixed end moments. The fixed end moments are W L square by twelve, so A F E M will be this much. But you don't use A F E M; you use minus A F E M. Okay, so A minus A external minus A F E M is what you use. Okay, if it's a concentrated load acting at the mid span, what is the end moment? What is the bending moment diagram like? It is like this, right? So what is this much? How much is moment? How much moment is applied here? Wl by eight. Wl by eight. P. Yeah. So Pl by eight. Okay. And this you can call minus or that's a P. So hogging moment of Pl by eight. Which was PL by four totally in the middle. So now it is also this is also PL by eight and that is also PL by eight in opposite directions. That is AFEM. You will again have to use minus AFEM. Yeah. So that's what I'm solving here. So this is what this is showing. AFEM is minus twelve W square by twelve. Likewise, you have to take RFEM if it is not a beam. Um, no, no, sorry. Still, RFEM also has will be required because that is also a degree of freedom. So R F E M that is M is the moment and R F E M that will be equal to W L by two, okay, in upward direction. These are the different fixed end moments given in the code, uh, no, not in the code in the textbook. Okay, so you can use this directly, or some of these you may be able to able to memorize. What you can can't memorize, you can use them from the textbook. In the exam. So in the next class, I think I'm. It's already six thirty. Um, let's uh, let's call it a day because I have another call coming in frequently. Um, this example we will solve in the next class, which is basically uh, just same type of an example that we have just done. But in addition to that, it also has this uh, forces acting along the length of the member. So there is one force acting here. Sorry, there is. Uh, there is one force acting along the length of the member here, and there is this distributed load acting on these two members. So, because of that, you have to take into account the FEM part of it, the fixed end moment part of it. That we will continue discussing in the next class. I hope uh, this concept of uh, fixed end moments was clear. And uh, this particular thing, why do we put a negative sign here instead of a positive sign? That should be very obvious to you. Okay. Please, uh, after this class, you. Uh, Spend some time and try to uh, explain to yourself why do we put this minus sign here? What is the purpose of this fixed end moments? All right. So uh, I had uploaded uh, one assignment also. 
you guys have, are working on it, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, 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 